Hello everyone and thank you so much for spending your Thursday morning here with me at uh, GPS Tech 348 .NET from the Grand Tree Cloud. So if you are running uh, .NET workloads on your data centers today and you are here to understand how you can take um, your .NET applications from your data centers to AWS Cloud, what are the challenges, what are the solutions, what are the best practices, you definitely want to be here for the next 50 to 55 minutes. Um, so. I will share my experiences around uh, those topics with you. A quick intro about myself. I'm Ethan Ferrosi, and I'm a senior solution architect, specialized in Microsoft workload. Um, as my title clearly says, it means that I've worked with Microsoft technologies for the past, I would say, 20 years, and um, working on different aspects of technologies from um, .NET applications. I've, I've been doing cutting codes for almost about um, as long as I remember. Uh, SQL Server, Active Directory, Microsoft Dynamics CRM, and, and any other tools which is related to Microsoft. And that's why I'm here today. I've been always on the customer side, and this is the first opportunity for me to kind of mix my, mix the, kind of a mix of opportunities and experiences that I used to have with customers, and now I have with AWS to share it with, the, with all of you today. Um, I'm based in San Francisco. It's been almost about a year ago that I moved from the land of uh, koalas and kangaroos and the most deadliest animals on earth, uh, white sharks, just name it, the spiders. You, does anyone know what, which, which country is that? Yeah, it's Australia. So the first takeaway for this session, I know it's not about the tourism, but if you are here and you haven't been to Australia, book your flight and go there for Christmas time. That's the best time up there. All right. so. First year at AWS, first time at reInvent. That's why I need your feedbacks. And I appreciate the score five. I know if you're happy with the session and you like me or you like the session, the contents, please share your honest feedbacks with me and I definitely would read uh, every single word of it. An important call out before I start. Um, on the Microsoft and .NET tracks, there are still a few other sessions left. Um, and more importantly, for those of you who haven't been to that, at 3.15 p.m. today, we have a workshop. I would be there also to answer the questions, but uh, that would be a very good follow-up on this session. If you're here today and you like the contents, that's an opportunity for you to experience the uh, hands-on and do everything that you heard today on a real workshop. So when I was um, thinking about putting this session together, I actually was thinking that I've uh, spent uh, the last 10 or 15 years to working on um, customer side. And every time that I've been um, leading a .NET team and we had these questions that the new technology has come in, uh, a new offering is or new services available, what is the right time to do it? What is the best practice? Shall we do it right now? Or what is the, how can we make sure that we are making the right decision? And that's why I thought over the past year that I've spent with AWS, um, I work with many customers, and this is exactly the same kind of feedback that we get. It's not about what the technology can do. That's the second step. The first step is that we want to make sure that we're making the right decision. So I thought going from data centers to AWS Cloud uh, might sound easy, but there are definitely challenges. So why not discuss about the migration strategies and also while you are on the cloud, then what's next? How can you actually modernize your application to do a cloud-native approach? Take, um, take the services which are available and improve your uh, workloads. And finally, uh, .NET Core is a hot topic for, for the last few years. And uh, I wanted to discuss that in a specific for serverless, because I know that m most of you are interested about that serverless. That's kind of a question that I got from the previous sessions. And um, so this is the stuff that we're going to go through. And finally, live demos. I want to take the risk and run the live demos here. Hopefully, everything goes well. So let's have a look at the story of .NET. Um, if you are old enough like me, you will remember the time that we used to work with VB6 and ActiveX controls for registering the DLLs. But basically, since then, everything has been changed and revolutionized. Uh, I, I remember around 2002 that the first release of .NET Framework has been announced, and then since then, we had different versions that have been improved. We built lots of codes on top of .NET Frameworks, and finally, .NET Core has been released. We changed the way that we uh, used to do the coding with .NET Frameworks, and 
earlier this year, I think it was around August or May, I don't remember exactly, but uh, it's been announced that .NET Framework 4.8 is the latest uh, release of a .NET. And uh, moving forward, .NET, uh, .NET Core and .NET Framework, we joined .NET 5, and then all of the future releases. So why is that important? It's because we know that there are a huge number of workloads running today on .NET Frameworks. And if we want to think about a future, make sure that we have a future-proof solution, we need to kind of, at some stage, we need to switch to .NET Core. It's not a mandatory thing, but it's, it's the best practice today that we need to do it. Of course, there are benefits about .NET. This session is not about teaching you how you use .NET or what is a .NET coding, but basically it's, it's important to understand that .NET framework applications that we're building today, they are based on, usually there are main four categories, right? You might have created Windows or web service in the past and then um, uh, MVC web applications or most uh, newest kind of, uh, newest type of application that we build is microservices. But Taking every single uh, bit of the code that we've, um, we've written for these kind of applications to, to the cloud, some of them are easy, some of them aren't because there are challenges. Not everything is available through the cloud or we have to do kind of refactoring through it. But the biggest challenge is that most of the applications are monolithic, especially if you go to the financial industry and the bankings. Those who haven't been started that kind of transformation, um, they start, they're still using the big, fat application uh, it can be a desktop application, or it can be a web application. But basically, to take those uh, kind of workloads to AWS Cloud, there are different strategies. I'm sure that you've heard about uh, six hours of migrations. I don't know how many times, maybe hundreds of times over the, um, during this week. But basically, you know that there are six different strategies in brief, which you can take when you're moving your, your workload to the cloud. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the top three that are pretty easy and, and straightforward. Uh, just give you an example. If you have something today, let's say you have a logging solution, that you ha there's a bespoke logging solution that you have today, and is, um, it's been written you know, uh, to centralize your log into a uh, stash or any kind of logging engine, and you are moving to the cloud. Um, we, we know that AWS is offering CloudWatch, so that can be a good replacement for that. So you can easily replace your logging engine with CloudWatch or any other services which are available. But what is more important is those three, rehost, replatform, and refactor, which we're going to uh, dive deep into those three methods because that's where you actually need to start to change your code. So let's have a look. Um, an example to that, if you are doing the rehosting, rehosting basically means lift and shift, which means you are taking the application as is and deploy it to the cloud. It can be running an application on IS. And all you need to do is do a, do a bit of configuration. And using the AWS, of course, it is using the EC2 virtual machines. The replatforming is when you're using the containers. It's kind of uh, modernizing applications. Uh, the containers also is a hot topic. I know that using different platforms, ECS, EKS, Fargate, um, they're kind of a container services which are available today. You are not just lift and shift. You are doing a bit of rethinking about what can I do better? What can I change here? And finally, is refactoring. Refactoring is where you actually um, start to sometimes knock down your application and start it from scratch, which is likely to happen. Something that developers like a lot, and I know the C-level doesn't like because it requires a huge investment on that. But what is important is that either of these um, uh, strategies that we are picking up and we are deciding on that, we have to keep in mind that the level of effort is going, going to increase. Rehosting is as easy as copy, copy and paste your files into your servers, but refactoring is where you have to start to use different patterns like a strangler pattern, to take every bit of application, doing uh, uh, on the a phased migration, uh, every single bit of your application going to be moved to the cloud. Now, rehosting on virtual machines, there are pros and cons for that. Pros is the fastest way of migration. You provision a new instance, which shortly I'm going to show you a demo on that, and then you deploy your application into that. You can log into your EC2 virtual machines, do everything that you're doing today in our data centers by setting up your IS configurations and any database connection strings that you have. But the cons is that you're missing the main benefits of cloud. There are reliability, uh, security, agility. There are the benefits of the cloud. But 
using the uh, virtual machine in the cloud is kind of similar. I know there's cost saving about it, but it's very similar to what you're doing today on your virtualization in your data centers. In contrast, we have containers. Containers is where you, as I said, when you are moving your application, you're not just thinking about what, I can, uh, what is the application, how I can set up the, and provision the new containers, and, and how I can bundle my um, container images. It's, it's, it's also about thinking of what is available in the cloud. For instance, if you have the new managed services like ECS or Fargate, they're looking after my clusters and more and more nodes and services. I want to think about reusing them. The, 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 the um, cons of that is you need to do some minor changes, maybe. For instance, if your application is um, using sessions, your, your sticky sessions, you have to think about how you can re-architecture it to uh, work better in, in terms of scaling. Because we know that when, when um, one of the benefits of the cloud is scalability. And using the containers, using the managed services for containers, that's definitely um, a value that can be added to your workload. And finally, refactoring. Currently, we have two options, two strategies for that. One of them is you can go to our serverless, or you can do the Linux containers. Linux containers is a new topic because of the .NET Core. Um, I know that most of us who used to do uh, .NET based on Windows and Microsoft, we probably are not very comfortable with Linux. But this is something that can, be, that can save us a lot of money. That's a huge cost saving for us and also as serverless as well, because you know the licensing costs for Microsoft and Windows, we don't need to pay for that. And also, Linux containers also give us an opportunity to have, a, have more reliable um, infrastructure. We, we don't have that midnight crashes for Windows servers anymore. The refactoring has that uh, hugest number of um, investment for, um, for starting to work. So that's why refactoring is always the last option that we want to consider. But when it comes to the .NET applications, the question is, which one is the best way? And I'm sure that that's what you expect to hear from me, that I say option one or two or three. But honestly, there is uh, no clear answer to that. We, the answer is, it depends. If you are running a legacy application, it's not a mission critical application, you might want to just use the virtual machine. That's enough for you. If you are using something that needs to be scaled, that's where you need to go for serverless and containers because that they can handle the workloads for you. So any of those solutions require the proper um, analysis at the beginning. That's why we usually recommend to go and start to list your applications that they're mission critical, or it's not high critical, or it's, it's uh, low priority, then, and start with them. And based on the needs, we can pick the different services which are available. So I'm going to pause it here for now and quickly show a demo on um, virtual machines and rehosting, which can be done by Elastic Beanstalk. And if it works, let me see. Here we go. All right, as some of you might be uh, familiar with uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk, that's a service which uh, you can easily tell, tell the Elastic Beanstalk that this is the kind of application that I have, this is the environment that I need, and it goes and takes care of everything for infrastructure for you. It is a very simple way to uh, provision the infrastructure and EC2 instances that you require, and that's the easiest way for migrate applications. If you want to get a taste of the cloud and see how things work on the cloud, that's definitely the way that I recommend you to do so. I'm going to give you a quick um, rundown of uh, Elastic Beanstalk and environment and what, a few configuration, and then show you a, a small demo of how you can deploy your application to that. So going to Elastic Beanstalk, I'm sorry, you can start creating a new application. New application is basically your web application. It's an uh, e-commerce shop or it's a Windows application, whatever you want to, you have today on your data center. So you, you simply give it a name for that. And then your application is created. Now, what you can do here, which is, to me, is very exciting, is that you can create different environments. Environments are like your dev or QA environment or your production. So 
You can choose from if it's a batch service which is running over the nights, so you want to create a working environment, you can create a web server. Web server is what we need because we need to run IIS for .NET applications. And then here, you specify the URL for that, which you want to go and access it. Um, so your application would be available at demo app devre.usws2, depends on the region that you've, ch you've chosen. And then for the platforms, you can choose any of these languages. Uh, Java, .NET, Python, all of them are supported. So I'm going to choose .NET. And then to start, you can deploy a sample application to that. That goes and create a basic default .NET application, .NET framework application. And or you can choose to upload your code. You, all you need to do is to do the .NET build and .NET publish and get that bundle and deploy it to the environment. There are other options which are available here. I'm not going to run all of them because, because of the time. But basically, a cool feature is that you can ask to have a single instance. A single instance basically create one EC2 instance. If you want to have a load balancing, you can switch to high availability. And that's where your capacity options here are available. And you can go and start to choose and say, I want a load balance environment, minimum two servers running, and maximum four. So it would be a scale up, up to four nodes. And if the traffic is low, it would be scaled down to two. And then other options that you can configure, depends on which availability zone I want to put in, or it would be automatic placing, and different kind of triggers for scaling. Depends on the CPU, or network, or this write, or read. These are kind of options which are available. So I've already created an application here, as you can see. And I've defined two environments for that. Uh, Rem, uh, it's a dev and also UAT. So, Quickly go to the EC2 and you see how the instances look like. So we have two instances now here because I've, I've created a single instance. The dev is the EC2 virtual machines and UITs as well. Right, so let's go to Visual Studio. I'm gonna go and create a new project and it would be .NET Framework application. I call it I've tried many names before, and I don't want to get any error on that. So let's pick a long name. And a typical MVC application, I don't need a, uh, HTTPS, and create. So wh when the project is created, and you want to publish it to the AWS uh, while it's loading, uh, you, you, might, you might have seen that uh, AWS Toolkit is the window that is uh, when you're installing the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio that gives you that AWS Explorer that you can use any of the credentials uh, for your, for, for the, from the console. You can create an IAM user and then get the credentials to here. And you can go and browse the majority of the services that you need for your development. As an example, you can see here that um, the Elastic Beanstalk that I've already created you can see that there is a demo dev and UAT. So kind of basic functionalities that you need are also available here. So my application is created. And I'm just, I want to just simply just publish it to AWS Elastic Beanstalk. This option is available when you install the AWS Toolkit. Now, we have the option without going to the console. We can create a new application environment. Or we can deploy to an existing one. I'm going to choose the existing one because provisioning a new environment might take a few minutes. And all you need to do is specify the .NET, uh, which is a .NET 4, because that's a .NET framework. I want to deploy debug or release. Uh, There's a kind of stuff that I'm sure you're familiar with that. And finally, deploy. So that might take a few minutes to build and deploy. Uh, so what we can do now is go back to Elastic Beanstalk. Oh, excuse me. Let me show you first the cloud formations, because um, if you are familiar with cloud formation, that infrastructure is code. Basically, you, de you define all of the infrastructure, the VPC, the, the nodes, the, all of the resources that you need in a, in, a, in a text file, basically. And cloud formation would go and run it for that. It's, it's scalable enough for your uh, DevOps, for your administration, network administration. And majority of the services in AWS run everything behind the scene based on cloud formation. What we do in the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio is that when you deploy to the um, Elastic Beanstalk, it actually creates a cloud formation templates and runs that. And that's where your, your environment gets updated. So these are, these are an examples of the cloud formations that I've used to create that environments. I'll show you the resources. 
And you see that as part of that, it has created a scaling group, a metadata, and many other security groups and other features that we have. So that publish has been successful. We need to go to Elastic Beanstalk. And all we need to do is that URL, which you see at the top, is my, the URL for my application. It is still updating the environment. So when I click on that, the service is unavailable, of course. Let me test the UIT for now. Because I created with a sample application, that's what AWS by default deploys into your environment. So let's have a look at the logs while the other one is getting deployed. You can request the logs because logs, is, logs are not instant. You can request it from the, from the instances that, that populate the logs and stream it into a text file so it's available for you to download. And of course, you see every, all of the logs that you have seen it on the normal Windows server. That's, that's kind of an instance that have been provisioned. The software protection, pr protection service has been installed. And I want to see if the, that deployment, yeah, it's been successful. You see the health. And now my application is there. As simple as that. Just one quick thing. I want to click on a few links here to see if I can populate the logs. If you go to the logs, it's available via the uh, CloudWatch. It's also available here. I can request the log again. And yeah, the logs are there. Right, so we have the monitoring, we have the health, it shows how many CPU utilization you have. So that's a very brief demo about, as you can see, how simple you can take your application and push it to the cloud. It's, if you have, the, apart from uh, provisioning your infrastructure, it's, it might take, I would say, five minutes for you to, to push the application. You, do, you don't need to do anything. All you need to do is that publish your application from the AWS toolkit. So let's get back to our presentation. All right, now, all right, now that we are in cloud, the, the next question is that, well, I've tested the cloud. It's, it's, it sounds good to me. How can I modernize my application? How I can leverage the, new, the, the benefits of the cloud? How I can write cloud-native codes? Um, the definition of the modernization for us in, in AWS terms is when you're taking in a specific for .NET application, is when you are trying to stay away from the Windows platform. And that, can, that is possible by using the serverless, because AWS Lambda serverless, which we have, is based on the Linux containers, and also the Linux containers as well, which you can use the Fargate or ECS. Those are kind of the services that you have. Um, the definition of serverless, um, we know what it is. Um, this is basically, there is no service, there is no infrastructure. It, means that, it doesn't mean that there is no service, it means that you don't see it, because we take care of everything. It's behind the scenes, it's a managed service. And the reality is, the less infrastructure that you provision, the more decision is made on your behalf. And as a result, you care less about availability. Because you are, you are given with the environment and infrastructure, which is self-healing. You don't, you don't pay for the idle time like you, what you do today for electricity, all of the char charges for your data centers. And also, you don't need to worry about um, the infrastructure at all. You, you just care about the business logics. And that's the benefit of the serverless. Serverless computing is one of the verticals that exists today. We have serverless for the databases, we can, like the DynamoDB or Aurora, or we have um, we have serverless also for uh, storage like S3. There are different services within AWS. But for the computing and for .NET application in a specific, we have two kind of services available. We have AWS Lambda, which I'm sure that you are, you're familiar with, the, with it. It's a, it's a new way of programming. It's a functionality that exists within the, it's a service that exists today with AWS. And also Fargate. Fargate is a serverless container management service. So if you work with ECS before, which I recommend if you, if you haven't, go and test it, because that's a very uh, cool tool, actually. Fargate is now uh, allows you to, to not care about any infrastructure, any node, any clustering, or anything that you have. All you need to do is that you give it to the Fargate, and it, it looks after all of the scaling of, and creating the cluster and nodes and deploying your applications. 
By the way, just a note that uh, I'm not sure if you heard a keynote from Andy Jesse, but uh, now the EKS, which is the Elastic Kubernetes Service, is now supported by Fargate. To me, it's a uh, huge improvement in the services because I work with the Kubernetes services and I know that there is a, it's kind of a pain that we want to go to and manage our cluster. So if you, if you have seen it, uh, it's probably on the AWS website that you can go and see the latest updates, but basically AWS EKS by Fargate is now available. So what are the differences? The question, should I go with the Fargate or shall I go with Lambda? Well, Lambda is designed for the short-term functions. If you have a function that is small enough, that can be run in a fraction of a second or up to minutes, then definitely that's the option for you. Uh, it should be a stateless because you want to run it and finish it, and you only paid for the or you will you will only pay for the time that you run actually that function. But Fargo is more long-running process. If you have a web application that you want to keep it running on the servers, like what you do into the data centers, but you want to benefit from the containers, then definitely Fargo is an option for you. And of course, with the Fargo, you bring in your own code um, because you have your application, you deploy it. But with the Lambda, you basically you need to do a bit of refactoring, as I said, because it's not as simple as just take your code and deploy it into that. There are solutions, which I'm going to go through it shortly, but you need to use one of the supported language and runtime languages that exist today. So with that, let's, let's uh, have a deeper look on the AWS Lambda. When you're creating an uh, AWS Lambda, there are different event sources. It's just a recap of for, to make sure that everyone, we are, we are on the same page. So event sources are how we trigger our functions. We, you create a function, you deploy it into the cloud, yet you want to trigger it. Let's say the function is go and read the database and return me the row with the specific ID, right? So there are different ways of triggering the Lambda functions. The first is you need to either access from the web, which is the HTTP event, which is available via the API gateway, which again is not in my demo and I'm going to show you. It can be one of the service events. You want to upload the file into the S3 that would trigger, an, uh, trigger a, uh, an alarm or invoke the Lambda functions because, for instance, you have an image, you want to resize it. So instead of going and pulling the um, S3 bucket to see if the new file is exist there or not, you basically, all you need to do is that set, it, set a trigger and assign it to the Lambda, and that would, that would trigger your Lambda functions. And also custom events is through the SDK. We have AWS SDK, when you write in the code, why the code, when the function is completed, you want to call it Lambda functions, for instance, to log into the database. That's also available. From the configuration perspective, there are two main things that you need to remember. First thing is that the memory, everything on the Lambda is based on the memory and indirectly the CPU, because if your application reads lots of, uh, requires lots of memory to be able to store, let's say, an array or, or the set of records in a, in a memory to be able to process it, that's where you want to specify the memory for it. There is a default for that, but you can increase it up to a certain limit. But you need to make sure that you, you configure your, your uh, Lambda functions in, uh, into the right size, because that's where it will impact your billing. And the timeouts, as I said, Lambda is designed for the short running functions. It's not designed for running 20 minutes uh, report generation. And if you are doing it and you, want it, you, you have an application that needs to be done in such a way, then that's where you need to start to rethinking about is the Lambda the right option for me or not. So again, I want to I repeat that because it's kind of a question that I've got um, every time with the new customers. And it's that almost everything is possible to be done via Lambda, but is the Lambda right fit for my problem or not? That's the question. That's when we need to an analyze and, and see number of factors, memory, CPU, uh, the, the time that I, the function is running. And if it's taking too long, we might need to break it down into multiple functions using the async methods and to be able to just um, break it down into smaller pieces that take less time, lower the cost, and actually perform the functionality that we need. And finally, about the billing, is uh, the way that you will be char charged for the Lambda is basically per 100 millisecond per function execution time. It, which it would be round up to the 100 milliseconds if your function takes, for instance, 250 milliseconds, it would be charged for 300 milliseconds. So that's how the billing is done. That's the, that's the main overview about the configuration on Lambda. And then on .NET, right? So as I said, modernization is about using either serverless or Firegate. 
And again, I said that it is uh, based on Linux containers and Linux um, OS. And we know that it's not possible by, doing, by staying on the .NET framework. That's why in the, at the beginning I show you that .NET framework is kind of getting to the end of it. And that's why we, at some stage we need to move to .NET Core. Because .NET Core gives give us that functionality and that uh, option to be able to open, uh, open our environment to the new world because then we can improve uh, our code to use the Linux, Linux environment or using the Lambda or Fargate. So .NET Core is the first step to modernization. And that's, again, we want it or not, at some stage we have to do it. So when we write in a .NET Core Lambda functions, it is as simple as we go and create a .NET application, .NET Core project, and we're targeting .NET Core app. So .NET Core 3 and 3.1, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, it has been announced that it's been now will be supported. .NET 3.1 has been released, so now it will be supported. Um, I'm not sure about the exact time, but probably after a couple of months it would be available for us. So we can target one of the .NET Core runtimes. And then we, all we need to do is not um, create an application, publish it using the .NET publish command, and the, the, the output bundle uh, files, we zip it and upload it to the uh, .NET Core Lambda. But what we recommend is that using a, an existing AWS tool for that, either AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio or the AWS Lambda tools, which is an extension to .NET CLI. The reason for that is we constantly are, are improving our Lambda engine. And if you're using the .NET, um, if you're using the .NET Publish, basically what it does is that it, it includes all of the dependencies. But if you use one of these tools that is managed by AWS, we're constantly removing the common libraries from the bundle and add it to the back end to the uh, engine. That means that your bundle would be, would be smaller and it would be loaded faster, and you wouldn't have that kind of cold, uh, cold start issues that some of you might have faced with Lambda. So we recommend to use any of those tools. Um, the structure of the Lambda function in three, um, each function in Lambda, there is a entry for that, and that's where the engine identifies that each, which function needs to be called, and that's called uh, function handler uh, for .NET in a specific, and it's an async task. And in an assembly file, uh, excuse me, in the serverless template file, you would, you would specify the full type name of that function entry. So for instance, it's, uh, for this example, is AWS Lambda 4 is a project name. I know it's not a good name, but it was a testing project. And then your function, and then your function handler, the full type name. And that's how we would go and find your function in the assembly and invoke it. Now, one of the cool features which um, has been released, it's not new, but it's available, is that most of us have created ASP.NET Core web applications, either using the Razor pages, or we have created like a normal HTML pages, or even front-end scripting like Angular, right? Um, there is a SP.NET Core application behind the scene, which has lots of controllers and pages. If we want to push that to the Lambda, it may not sound right to you because you say, oh, this is a web application. Why, what's the point of pushing the whole application into one single Lambda? The fact is that we have, we have had this kind of request from the customers that we learned that Migrating the whole application to the Lambda requires a bit of refactoring and re-architecturing. So that's an easy way for you to migrate your existing .NET applications, .NET Core applications, into Lambda. My demo would cover that, and I'll show you a few examples of that later. But let's, let's have a look at the structure of that. So in a normal world, when you're running your ASP.NET Core web application, basically your application is faced with the, one of the, your um, web servers like IS or NGINX, and then the Crystal, which is the internal um, web server by, S by .NET Core that would handle the request and forward it to the ASP.NET Core uh, hosting. So Crystal is actually, excuse me, Kestrel is actually um, marshalizes this request between and back and forth between your core hosting and uh, IS. But when it goes to the Lambda and you push your application to that, is API Gateway would replace the IS, and the Lambda is looking after all of these back and forth requests between these two. That's how we managed the ASP.NET Core web application on Lambda. This is kind of a behind the scene, what is happening here. Now, creating an ASP.NET application on Lambda is as easy as you include one of these, uh, you include this NuGet package in your application. It's the ASP.NET Core server. And by doing that, it actually starts to create and add some files to your applications. 
And uh, again, it's, it's easy to migrate. And I would recommend that as an interim step, if you want to migrate to the cloud, you have a big application and you don't know how, where to start and you want to test it, that's a, that's a very good way to start it. It's definitely there are um, benefits of doing that because you don't need to spend time to learn about the asynchronous programming or event-driven architecture because you have an application, you want to just push it to the Lambda and benefit from the, you know, the scaling um, features of the Lambda. But, your package is actually the .NET, all of the dealers and your bundles because it includes all of the applications. Everything that you might not even need for the Lambda is bundled into those uh, libraries and the uh, output file. And that would be deployed to Lambda and it causes a smaller um, a startup, uh, excuse me, longer uh, startup time for, for your functions. All right, let's, let's have a look at an example. Imagine that we have a set of APIs and normal controller and APIs, like the, I would say, the shopping list API, and we have three different methods, right? A get, an add item, or a post, or delete. So that's how we usually start to create our application. Now, option one, which as I said, is with .NET Core application, we wanna deploy it. What it does behind the scenes is that we create an API gateway in front of it that, that intercepts all of the incoming HTTP requests and your, the whole application is actually going through the Lambda. So all you need to do is that deploy application and hit that URL in API Gateway, and your application is there. Cons and pros, we discussed that. You know, the big application goes into the Lambda. But option two is refactoring and re-architecturing. Of course, that that would give you the idea that how you need to start to breaking down your functions, your controllers, your action actions in the controller into a smaller piece of functions. That the complexity behind this is that the system is not gonna work as you are doing it today. You need to do, um, it's, it's, it totally requires a shift in the mindset for the whole team because this is based on event-driven architecture. For those of you with the, like, uh, um, uh, service bus in the past, and now we, are, we can leverage those kind of same functionality using the SQS or SNS, uh, kind of a queues and ma managed services which are available via the AWS. Basically, we require that kind of things behind the scene because I get if, for example, if we are calling a function and that function is calling another one, using the async program, you don't know when it, the function is going to be finished or terminated, is it successful or not, and sh shall we go to the s second function down the track to be able to call it? This is, got, this is a whole different idea. This is a whole different world of programming, and which is recorded event-driven architecture, of course. And doing that and stepping right into it, I don't think that's a wise decision to make. That's why we usually recommend that if you have an existing application, go and start it to push into the AWS Lambda using ASP.NET Core, uh, uh, NuGet package, as I mentioned, and then start to bit by bit, see how you can re-architecture it. How, what, we, what are the functionalities that can work stateless? We can take it off and push it into the Lambda and what we need to change behind the scene to be able to that function to call another function. If you have a workflow, the option for you is using the step functions that can give you the full workflow and you can identify which step is being completed, which step is not, where is the error is happening, what is, what, how long it's gonna take. So I don't wanna stay on that slide uh, longer than that, but basically comparing those, those two options, we, show, we, we should, uh, should give you an idea of how, which, which one is actually the right fit for you. As an as a initial step, you wanna go and push the whole application to the Lambda, if, if Lambda is your preferred uh, platform, and then on top of that, we kinda of start to refactor it and improve the code. So there are different aspects to that. Um, it's not just about coding. We know that w for all of the existing workloads, we have things like logging, security, monitoring, tracing, debugging. And if, we are, if you are thinking about going to Lambda, we need to make sure that all of, the, all of the boxes are ticked. It's not as easy as say, hey, I'll pick Lambda, and this is the right solution for me. We need to make sure if we have logging something today, we have the same, the same functionality available in AWS. So, because of the time, I won't be able to cover everything, but I've, I'm going to call out a few things and also show you in the demo. So logging is definitely the first and top priority thing that we need. Um, Amazon CloudWatch is there. 
and everything in the Lambda, Lambda functions can be integrated all into the one stream of uh, logs. Um, and there are different methods of calling it. You, you can use the Lambda built-in uh, logger class, which is a Lambda logger, as, as you can see in the, in the slide. So Lambda logger.log and you log it. Whatever you log in there, or log into the console, or the context object of the Lambda, that will go directly into the CloudWatch. And that's where you can see all of the logs. And finally, there is um, X-Ray. Um, X-Ray is, is a service that is going to collect all of the data from your request and your functions and execution. And, is, and, is, and that tool actually gives you a, um, a console that you can view, filter the logs, and see how much your, your requests are, are taking. And that's a, that's a perfect tool for uh, monitoring and uh, debugging, not debugging, monitoring your um, data and applications. But it, it's, it's very useful if you have a microservices. Microservices board are included of multiple different services. You might be distributed, and you want to have a centralized monitoring way to understand that from function A to function C, for instance, if there are five functions in between, which one is taking longer? Which is, where is the bottleneck? That's where you want to use the X-ray. And I want to show you an example of that. The way that you can implement it and instrument your application is by installing a NuGet package. That NuGet package allows you, gives you the SDK that you kind of start writing and logging into the um, a specific part of the method that you need, and that will log into the console. And the service map, uh, which is shown here as an example, is that it exactly shows the map which part is taking, how long, how long each part is taking. And the cool thing is that it even goes down to the database level. So if you have a DynamoDB, you're calling the database, and your query is taking, let's say, five seconds, you will see it here. All right. Let's jump into another demo. And I show you the full examples of, a couple of examples. Um, hopefully, we have enough time for that. Here we are. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and create a new project. And I'm going to pick the ASP.NET. If you, if you look at the uh, templates and blueprints which are available, if you type serverless, you see that there are multiple um, options are available that you can start with, as, at least for your testing. And uh, ASP.NET serverless application .NET Core, either with tests or not, that's, the, that's without the test. Um, and you can start it with, with, the, with the test anyone. one. So .NET Core, I'm going to create one. And I will call it Lambda ASP.NET Core App. That's a silly name, isn't it? All right, so there are different blueprints that are available. What I'm going to pick now is ASP.NET Core Web App, which is going to create the simple ASP.NET application, .NET Core application, with the Razor pages. And you know, it has default um, pages, uh, Razor pages in that. And there are a few files in it, which I want to highlight now. So first thing first, uh, we have a serverless template. That's what the NuGet package that I mentioned would add it into that. Um, the engine would add that file by default. And this serverless template, there is a resources section. Can everyone see the screen? Do you want me to zoom in a little bit? Yeah, that might be better. So it's not the core function. is where your function is defined. The handler is full function name, function handler async. That's the entry point for, for your Lambda. And then you have the resources here. And as you can see, there is a slash proxy. What it does is that, because you think about that, that slide that I show you, everything goes into API Gateway. And that will redirect it to the core Lambda, which is going to process that incoming request and send it to the correct routing. That proxy is actually just, just a proxy. It doesn't process anything. It takes your request, your URL, your query string parameters, and everything else with that, and just forward it to the ASP.NET Core hosting to be able to process it. And of course, the output, which is your environment, which your uh, application is available. Now, that Lambda entry point is the file that should exist. And that basically has that function handler async. If you don't see it here, because I don't want to override it, that's been overridden and managed by the, uh, the ASP.NET Core 
package and it's, it's in the base class, so you don't see it here. And one important file is local entry point. Um, this is not part of the demo, but keep in mind that Lambda logging, because it's, everything is running on the infrastructure, uh, running serverless, logging is kind of a bit of a challenge. There are different solutions for that, but if you want to do the local uh, logging on your Lambda functions, that's where you need to start to put code into that, add codes into that section. That's where you want to, you will be able to, using the SAM or any other libraries, debug your application. Now, um, let's quickly deploy that. So, publish to AWS Lambda, there is a new option now available. All right, all you need to do is that you specify a stack name. That's where it's going to create your cloud formation behind the scene. So I'm going to call it Reamware Lambda ASP.NET Core Lambda Stack. And there is a three bucket. The three bucket which is needed here is basically the zip file would be uploaded to that. A Lambda engine will read the code from there and deploy it to your uh, Lambda environment. So I'm going to use one of the existing Lambda existing S3 buckets, and that's it. Which region you want to deploy that, what configuration, what is the .NET uh, framework that I'm using, .NET Core, actually, .NET Core version. And that's it. It's going to deploy it. it. For the first time, it might take a few more minutes to do it, but once it's deployed, the next uh, deployment would be faster and easier because your infrastructure is ready and it's just up to update the code in that. So let's go to console, and I'm going to Close this windows. All right. So, first of all, cloud formation, just to give you an idea that how it is. So you see that Reem and ASP.NET Core Lambda stack creating progress. That's where the AWS Toolkit has been uh, initialized. The resources that it's creating is a function role and all of the security um, and, and resources that it requires to be run. We have to wait for that to be completed. But while we can go to API Gateway. So API Gateway, as I said, is um, it works as, as, as your uh, as interception for your incoming HTTP requests and your application. Um, when you deploy the ASP.NET Core application, it creates a new ASP.NET. Uh, excuse me, um, API Gateway for you. It's been already created. So by default, it will create multiple resources. You can go and add more for your general um, application that you have, um, any, any kind of method you want to add or resources, or you can add uh, and change, you know, the new get method, you have multiple get methods for your application. Everything will be defined here. It's, it's as simple as your routing um, in your .NET application. So the proxy, uh, and of course, you see that proxy, it shows the integration. So we have that, let me zoom in. It's been integrated with the method request. That's where your, your method is getting called, and then integration request, which is a Lambda proxy, and your Lambda behind the scene is here. So that's how the, the request goes, goes in. Um, so API Gateway, by the, by the way, is, is where you can put all of the authentication in front of it. It's like any other um, uh, API management tool. So if you put, all, if you have, a, for instance, OAuth token or um, any kind of Windows authentication, excuse me, not the Windows authentication, any kind of authentication that you have, you put it, you can add it to the API gateway. That's where it would throttle your uh, request. So let's quickly have a look at the Lambda function that has been created. On the Lambda on the side, you see application, and that's the two ways. Go directly to the console and start to create your uh, Lambda functions. That's one way. And if you go through the Visual Studio, that's basically an AWS toolkit would create a .NET uh, Lambda application. And that's everything is bundled to one application. It's just the way that we structure it. So the application is here, and that application contains multiple functions. And there is only one function, ASP.NET Core. And that's exactly because of the reason that I mentioned, is one big fat function sitting there containing the whole application, and we are going to call that. So let's have a look at that. All right. Quickly, each Lambda functions, you have two, on the, on the sides, on the, on the console, you see two sides. First is the way that you're going to trigger your Lambda function, which, for, which in our case is API Gateway. And the other side is the destination. If your Lambda function has been completed, what I want to do next? What is the next thing? I want to call and write something to the S3 bucket. I want to send an email or 
uh, raise a uh, CloudWatch alarm or anything else. There's, there are different events that can be integrated into that. API Gateway, you see that API Gateway has created that uh, proxy for you. So that's what we're going to call it. And your Lambda functions, uh, all of the functionalities and uh, basic configuration, the runtime, the, the zip file. And down here, you will see an option, which is the X-ray. I'm going to uh, enable that for the next uh, demo that I'm going to show you. But basically, that's where I mentioned you can see the full service map of your course. So let's quickly test it. If I go and click on your API gateway, excuse me. So I should remove that proxy from here. That's it. Your Dart application is up and running. And if I click on multiple pages, that's exactly the same as your application running on IS. And what you can do is now get back to monitoring page. And you see the CloudWatch metrics. Everything is available via CloudWatch, but that's the integrated way of looking at the locks. So it might take a few uh, seconds, depends on the sampling. Um, so you see there are three invocations because a call application, click it twice. And each of these tabs can be um, explored more and you can dive deep into that. One cool thing is, if you look at the console, CloudWatch logs insight. It hasn't been populated yet. Oh, we need to be patient for that. All right, let's have a look at that first until that's ready. So this is where you can see the errors. That's how your function, how long it's been taken. For instance, that, that the average has been 294 milliseconds, and the minimum has been 9 seconds. So just as a, as a side note, you've seen that kind of call to start, which many, I've, I've heard of the call as an issue, but I don't see it as an issue. Basically, any function in Lambda that needs to be run initially for the first time that the function is triggered, the engine needs to be set up. So the .NET engine for that function needs to be run. So it, it creates the environment for you, and your function is exist there. So for the upcoming request, that would trigger that function. But basically, it's like if you have a million calls, it's, it's like the first in a million. So it's not noticeable. It's, uh, if you are testing your application, you might say, see that after deployment, it takes five seconds. And then after that is two digit seconds for calling of Lambda functions. I just want to call out because the call to start seems to be, uh, for some of us, is a challenge when using Lambda. But to me, it's not an issue. It's kind of a, a reality that we are facing for any other programming language. All right, so let's quickly have a look. These uh, logs here give you a very insightful numbers. First of all, as you see here, the duration in milliseconds, the build duration in milliseconds, that's where I said that it's going to be round up. So uh, it's a 100 millisecond block. And I've, I've, I've already brought up the pricing page for Lambda. You can see here the first million uh, requests per month is free. That's amazing if you want to test in your application. So million calls, no cost at all. Or is 100 gigabytes per second. And that's where your memory impacts your functions. So if you are running a function that is taking, um, let's say, you have one request that is taking uh, one second, you're having two requests or taking half a second, they're kind of same in terms of the billing. And then all of the charges, uh, as you see, there's a very small uh, number. It would be uh, numbered by the number of calls, so uh, for every gigabyte second. Let's get back to that um, console, and I want to quickly show Show the locks. So that's basically the locks which has been created. All right, I've only got uh, six minutes left. I want to quickly uh, just show you another demo, which I'm sure I'm going to create another serverless application. And I'm going to choose Block API using DynamoDB, which is a DynamoDB behind the scene. There are a, a get put post method for that. In that function, I'm going to install a NuGet package for it, which you can use AWS X-ray recorder. 
and that's where you can install the X-ray for your application. So when it's installed, and it's ready. So in uh, any of these um, functions, there are multiple Lambda functions in that. It's not like the ASP.NET. It's a simple Lambda functions, which we're going to call by API Gateway. And then I'm going to deploy that first while it's getting ready. Let's deploy it to a Lambda and put it into the into there, so the application will be created. And while it's being deployed, I'm, I'm going to add, yeah, I'm going to add the X-ray into that code. So let's go to the uh, get blocks. So you see that function, context logger, it goes, it logs to the uh, CloudWatch log. So, that's right. So X-ray recorder, if I'm spelling it correctly, let me see. Yeah. All right, so that's part of your NuGet package. Just copy paste it for these scenarios that are usually running out of time and Ah. All right, that's where you shouldn't take the risk to run the live demo because it's kind of, when it's not enough time for it. So let's see if the NuGet package has been sold. So let's go back to, here you go. And I'm going to add, there is a singleton instance for that. I'm going to add begin sub-segment. And I want to tell you that, what does that mean for us? And do the same. And at the end of the function, I'm going to call end sub-segment, right? So published, and here we go. So let's go to the console. Again on the API Gateway and Lambda. So you see that all of these, if I go to the application, blog Lambda stack have been created with all of the functions and individual Lambda functions. So I'm going to go to the get blocks and enable the X-ray here. So when you enable the X-ray, those instruments that you've put into your code will integrate with that, and you can see the logs into that. Quickly test it. So to test the, to test the get blocks, you can test it via the console. I'm going to uh, create a test method, get blocks, because it doesn't need anything. All right, so testing it from here. The test is succeeded, 200. So of course, you can, it can return any 400, 500 errors, depends on what you're doing. And I do another test. And on the monitoring section, you see the CloudWatch locks. That function has been invoked how many times? And the cool thing is on the AWS X-ray, if I refresh the log, you see that, right? So this is one of the requests that I want to show you. That's the, that's the benefit of and the service map of your X-ray. So you can see your request all along the way to the function and that goes to the end. And then each function, how long it's going to take. That's the best way that you can measure the performance on each individual sections. You saw that the begin subsegment and end subsegment, you can add as much as you want into that, add annotation, add metadata to that. And that's where you can add notes. You see, this function has taken that long. That function, or the part that goes to the database, is taking longer than the other one. 
And this um, get block subsegment is what I added. So you can see in, in overall my function for the first time, it took seven seconds and four of 4.6 seconds of that has been basically taken by that section of code. So with that, let's, let's get back to the slides and I do my final things on that. I know that we are running out of time. Um, so a few important call outs. I know that I, I didn't cover everything and honestly, one hour is not enough for the whole um, stuff that's related to the .NET and, and servers or Lambda. But if you are thinking about it, debugging your .NET um, Lambda functions, there are tools available. Cloud9, which is a native um, IDE with AWS, AWS Toolkit for VS Code, SAM server application model with, with model which by itself it requires at least, I don't know, maybe a couple of hours to, to go through it and show you, show you the examples. And finally, the JetBrains Rider is it's a new announcement made um, this week. Uh, the tool is now available, available for those uh, who are using the JetBrains Rider. That's a um, perfect IDE. I know that most of us are using it sometimes rather than Visual Studio. So these are the tools that you can use for that. And there are, obviously there are reasons that we want to run .NET on AWS. It might, it might be a question for, for many of us, that's why, because of course we, AWS provide a full support for the uh, .NET application and workloads. Also, the latest .NET framework and .NET cores, as you can see, as, as soon as they're released, in a, in a short matter of time, it would be available on .NET um, for the, for the AWS and the runtimes that we have. So with that, I'd like to thank you everyone. Um, for, some, for those of you who are part of the AWS partners, please um, check the API Navigate, and that's a way that you can start to uh, work through the competency programs. I'm, I'm a PSA, so I'm a partner solution architect. I mainly work with the partners. Those of you who are partners, I'm more than happy to get connected and answer your questions. And thank you so much.